thought I'd do a little city park for a change of pace. I'm at Confluence Park here in San Antonio. Today, we're going to talk about rules of implication. Um, truth tables are great. They're a nice mechanical way of demonstrating validity. But truth tables don't necessarily tell you the steps that you take. With some of these premises, it looks downright mysterious how you get from the premises to the conclusion. Uh, we'll use the rules of implication to show the steps, the steps of inference from these premises to the conclusion. And what these rules tell us, to do, tell us is what sort of proposition we can infer from other propositions. Well, the first rule we're going to deal with is called modus ponens. Modus ponens is about as straightforward as a rule of implication as it gets. <laughs> um, it's you know composed of two propositions or premises. One's a conditional, and one is the assertion, and the second is the assertion of the antecedent. So remember, a conditional is composed of the antecedent, the consequent, and the antecedent is sufficient for the consequent. Meaning, if the antecedent is true, the consequent must be true. And when we assert the antecedent, we can infer the consequent. Like I said, very straightforward. So, uh, to use an example we've used repeatedly, <laughs> if my pet is a dog, then my pet is a mammal. Let's say that's our first premise. My second premise, or second proposition, is my pet is a dog. We can infer from those two propositions, my pet is a mammal. And we use the rule modus ponens to make that inference. Now, in this course, we're going to be uh, creating formalized arguments, right? We're going to label the premises and we're going to show what steps we take to get uh, from the premises to the conclusion. In this case, we only have one, but don't think that every, <laughs> as a matter of fact, very few of the arguments we're going to look at have only one step. <clears throat> but let's just deal with this one right now, right? So in formalizing our arguments, just like we had rules for our truth tables, we're going to have rules for our, uh, for these for, for these, uh, uh, for the rules of application. Right. Okay, so rule 10, continuing our list, rule 10, uh, provide the sequence first. All right. So in our formalization, we're going to write the sequence. Let's just deal with the same argument uh, so that you know, we're not getting lost anywhere. Right. And our sequence has two premises, or the conditional P greater than symbol Q, that represents if P then Q. That's the first premise. We have our comma. Then the second premise is we have the assertion that they exceed. That's just quite simply P. So we put if P then, you know, P then Q, right? comma, P. Then we have our two vertical lines. And we have Q. That's our argument. All right. That's rule 10. Rule 11 is to number each line, each proposition in our, form, in our argument. Okay. That's rule 10. So just keep that in mind. We're always going to have line numbers for each, each, each of our, uh, 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 for our argument, for each step. Rule 12 says to label or cite, provide a citation for our premises. And the citation we'll use will be the letter A. Could have used P for premise, but that would have probably been more confusing right, since we have P all over the place. So we'll use uh, letter A, and let's say it stands for assumption. Okay. So uh, line one, we have if P greater than simple Q, and we're gonna cite A, right? This, we didn't, and what A means is we didn't infer it from anything, we're starting with this. <coughs> okay, line two, we have P. And again, we cite it with A. So we fulfilled rules 11 and 12, we've numbered our lines, and uh, 12, we've uh, provided the citation, namely the letter A, okay. Next step is we're going to infer Q from our first two premises. And this brings us to rule 13. Rule 13 says that we cite in our citation, we got Q, right? In citation, first we provide the line numbers from which we made that inference. And in this case, it's one comma two comma, one comma two comma, we put a space. And then we 
provide the rule that we're using. And in this case, it's modus ponens, and we're abbreviate modus ponens with MP. Okay. Like I said, you probably think, well, this is a no-brainer, and it is. <laughs> it's, it's about as straightforward as it gets as far as the rule of implication is concerned. But that's also why I start first. Helps us get us, helps get us started. So that's modus ponens. Let's take a look at the rest of the rules. All right, the next rule of implication that we have is modus tollens. And modus tollens, uh, again, uses a conditional. Right? Uh, if P, then Q. But instead of asserting the antecedent, uh, we deny the consequent. Instead of asserting the antecedent, we deny the consequent. So, uh, for instance, we can go back to <laughs> my pet is a, a dog and my pet is a mammal. Um, uh, well, let, let's try something sound this time, right? If my uh, pet is an iguana, then my pet is a reptile, right? Okay, so that's still a true condition. Right? Uh, if my pet is an iguana, then my pet is a reptile. Well, it, it, you know, it's false that my pet is a reptile. <laughs> it's false that my pet is a reptile. So it's false that my pet is an iguana. So as before, we're going to follow our rules for formalization. Uh, we're going to have line one. Uh, it's the conditional if P then Q. Line two, we're going to have the denial of the consequent. And remember, I use that little minus sign on our keyboard for the denial of the consequent, or for, you know, uh, negation, excuse me, negation. And we label, we cite both with A. Right. Oh, I forgot about the sequence. I got to make sure you put the sequence in there. <laughs> you know, P then Q, comma, negation of Q, two vertical lines, negation of P. Um, <clears throat> that's line one and two with our citation. We're going to use A as our citation. Uh, line three right, is where we make our inference of negation of P. We have our inference at line three. But we're also going to provide our cite or our citation, right? We got we made this inference from line one and two. And we have a comma, you know, one, comma, two, comma, no space, right, between the numbers in the comma, one, comma, two, comma. Then there's a space, right? Space between the last comma and the citation, or the, uh, so the rule used. And we'll use MT to uh, for our abbreviation for modus tollens. So that's modus ponens and modus tollens. Now, I, I want to offer a little word of caution here. Right. We're talking about an invalid inference. Uh, back with modus ponens, we assert the antecedent to infer the consequent, and that's just fine. But, you know, don't think that you can assert the consequent and then infer the antecedent. Right? That's an invalid inference. Uh, so, for instance, let's try this, right? We'll use the condition we just talked about. If my pet is an iguana, then my pet is a reptile. Or uh, let's try this. Let's try this. Another true proposition. If my pet is a cat, and my pet's a cat, right? we talk, I've talked about my dog before. You see my dog. My pet's a cat. Uh, then my pet is a mammal. Right? Now, that's a true condition. Right? Uh, animal being a cat necessitates that it's a mammal. All right. Uh, well, let's have the uh, assertion of the consequent. Right? Uh, my pet is a mammal. By the way, we've got two true premises. If my pet's a cat, then my pet's a mammal, and my pet's a mammal. <coughs> we have two premises. And from this, we infer that my pet is a cat. Well, I think my dog would be very upset about that accusation. <laughs> so, no, this, this is an invalid inference. We've got two true propositions. We've affirmed, you know, by trying to affirm the consequent, we, we infer the antecedent. We infer the antecedent, but then we get something false. You know, my pet is a cat. So this is an invalid inference, and it's a classic error in logic called affirming the consequent. Now, affirming the consequent is not valid. Affirming the consequent is not valid, and then by inferring the antecedent, right? <clears throat> Similarly, right, that's affirming the consequent, and it kind of looks like modus ponens, but it's a mistake, right? It's a mistake. Similarly, we've got denying the antecedent. So let's take our true conditional, if my pet's a dog, i uh, sorry, it would take that, that conditional. If my pet is a cat, then my pet's a mammal. All right. That's true. Uh, second premise, my pet is not a cat. This is also true. Right? This is also true. My pet's, not, uh, um, my pet's not a cat. But then from this, we infer that my pet is not a mammal. Right? That's another error and reason. We've got two true premises and a false conclusion. 
two true premises and a false conclusion. So that's not going to work. Okay, well, golly. So we got modus ponens, we got modus tollens. These are two good rules of inference. And we talk about two errors, two formal, uh, formal errors in reason, affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent. Well, let's keep going with our rules of implication. We're going to cover two more. Okay, so far we've looked at two rules of implication and two errors in reason, right? Two formal fallacies. Uh, let's take a look at another rule of implication, again using conditional. But instead of just one conditional and you know, either the assertion of the antecedent or the value of the consequent, uh, we're going to have a second conditional. <laughs> now, hypothetical syllogism right, it, it allows us to infer a further conditional. But, you, you know, there's a catch. So we got two conditionals and we infer a third. The catch is this. The consequent of one conditional has to also be the antecedent of another. So let's stick with my dog. My favorite topic <laughs> for this logic course. My favorite topic for the logic course, my dog. Uh, if my pet's a dog, then my pet's a mammal. That's true. And what's also true is if my pet is a mammal, then my pet is uh, endothermic, which means warm-blooded. It regulates... Uh, she regulates on body temperature. Well, so we have those two conditionals, and uh, let's, by the way, let's formalize these, right? Using our rules that we studied before for formalizing premises, uh, we have FP then Q as our first premise, and then if Q then R for our second premise. And from this, we're going to infer if my pet's a dog, then my pet is endothermic. All right. So uh, we have, it's just setting up our sequence, right? Following our rules to start off our formalization. We have our sequence, P, you know, greater than symbol Q, comma. Then we have Q greater than symbol R. Okay. And we have our two vertical lines. And from this, we infer P greater than symbol R. All right. Well, let's uh, uh, put it into our symbolized argument, our formal argument. We have FP, then we have our line one, P greater than symbol Q. And again, following our rules, Give the citation A. Then we have Q greater than symbol R. Yeah, that's line two, greater, uh, Q greater than symbol R. Again, we have our citation A. And then lastly, we have our inference. Once again, we have P greater than symbol R. And for, uh, we have our lines, right? Following rule 13, we get our two lines, one comma, two comma, space. And for hypothetical syllogism, we uh, cite the rule H, uh, we abbreviate the rule HS. So that's three rules of inference, modus potens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism. We've got one more to go. So the last rule we're going to look at using a conditional, at least for this chapter, we're going to have more later, but at least for this chapter, <laughs> uh, is called conditional proof. Right. Now, conditional proof is a little strange uh, because you're proving something by assuming something else. Now, that seems odd. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't, just, I can't just go around assuming that, <clears throat> you know, unicorns exist for the sake of what validating Tolkien's claims about unicorns, if he made any. I don't really know if he did. Right. That, that, that's a bad idea. Yeah. But, uh, well, we, we can still prove something by making an assumption. And, you know, believe it or not, you already do this, right? So if you've ever had a discussion with somebody and what uh, they were wanting to talk about, let's just say Bigfoot, right? Let's say they're talking about Bigfoot. And you don't think Bigfoot exists. Right? Um, but you say something like this, well, assume for the sake of argument that Bigfoot exists. Well, that you're making an assumption in order to prove something else. You say, assume for the sake of argument that Bigfoot exists, then his feet would be substantially, or Bigfoot's feet, would be substantially bigger than any human being's foot, uh, but it would retain the same bone structure, since, in all likelihood, uh, this Bigfoot is a, you know, uh, uh, is a, has a common ancestor with uh, Homo sapiens. Okay. Suppose that's what... 
Well, you know, then what you're doing there is you're creating a conditional. If Bigfoot exists, then, then what? If Bigfoot exists, then Bigfoot has a common ancestor with Homo sapiens. Uh, and since Bigfoot has a common ancestor with Homo sapiens, uh, Bigfoot's foot bone structure on his feet will be a lot like human, uh, human beings. Okay. So, uh, you know, you're not saying Bigfoot exists, but assume for the sake of argument that Bigfoot exists. Well, this is, this is, and, you, and you're not saying Bigfoot exists, right? You're not saying Bigfoot exists. All you're doing is saying that certain things follow on the assumption that Bigfoot exists. Certain things are implied on the assumption that Bigfoot exists. Okay. So we uh, do this in formal reasoning. It's called a conditional proof. And you know, you're, you're inferring a conditional, right? Using the rules of implication to infer a conditional. We've already seen one rule that does this. We have hypothetical syllogism. Now, hypothetical syllogism is great for inferring conditionals, but sometimes you don't have the necessary conditionals in the argument in order to make the inference using hypothetical syllogism. So, uh, you know, maybe you have to create your own. And you can create your own conditionals given what you already have in an argument using conditional proof. All right. So, to do this, Right, let, let's try this argument. Let's try this sequence. Uh, if P, then Q. Now, from this, it's probably pretty clear, but you know, let's say it anyway. This is a real simplest, simplest thing. Let, let's, let's try this. You know, if my dog, if my pet is a dog, then my pet's a mammal. We've been using that. Well, from that conditional, another one follows. Uh, if my pet is not a mammal, then my pet is not a dog. Now, that, that should be pretty straightforward. I mean, you're looking over Modus Tollens and like, yeah, I mean, I, I see that. I, I get that. But notice, right, we, we don't have the denial of the consequent in order to therefore conclude that my pet's not a dog. And, and by the way, that would be an invalid inference, right? If we conclude if my pet's a dog and my pet's a mammal, my pet's not a dog, if we somehow make that inference, we've done something invalid because, like I said, my pet's a dog. Okay. But we can still conclude that conditional. And we do this using conditional proof. So, here's what the sequent looks like. If P then Q, it's a one premise argument. P greater than symbol Q, double vertical line, not Q, greater than, not P. If P then Q, therefore, if not Q, then not P. Now you look at this and like, whoa, hold on a second. <laughs> um, that, that's it. We only get one premise. You only get one premise. But we could do this using conditional proof. So um, let's start. Let's start the argument, right? So we got rule ten. We put our sequence at the top of our, our formalized argument. Right? Rule eleven. We're numbering our premises. Rule twelve. We have our single proposition, our single piece of evidence of P then Q. We place it there, and we have the citation A. That tells us that it's our premise. Well, what do we do next? Well, we want to prove this conditional. If not Q, then not P. In order to do this, um, we're going to have to make an assumption. Now, you might wonder, well, what assumption can I make? Can I make just any assumption? Let's assume, not R. Well, I, you can do that. I suppose we're not going to be able to do much with it, right? Well, you no, know, we want to prove the conditional. If not Q, then not P. So to do that, we assume not Q. So, you know, here's a little clue. If you're going to use conditional proof, to prove a conditional, or to, to infer a conditional, you start by assuming the antecedent. So we have our line two here. We have our antecedent. You know, we, uh, you know it's the antecedent that I conditionally you want to prove, right? Not Q. That's our assumption. Now you don't just assume if not Q, then not P. Therefore, are proven using conditional. Proof. No, that's not what's happened. You have to make an assumption and infer something for, from it in order to uh, uh, infer the conditional. So. We have uh, our assumption, not Q, but we don't cite it as A, right? That would be a mistake. That would list it as one of our premises, and we're setting up modus tollens, right? That's not what we're doing. We start with, uh, we, we have not Q, but we cite it as ACP, which is going to be short for assume for the sake of conditional proof. Okay. So we've assumed it for the sake of conditional proof. What now? Well, we draw an inference from it. Well, we're drawing inference from it. And uh, what are we going to infer? We're going to infer not P. Right? We're going to infer not P. And we'll use lines 
1 and 2, and our rule would be a modus tollens. Okay, so we're using modus tollens within conditional proof, and in all likelihood, you're going to have to. I don't know what you could assume or what you could prove just by making an assumption. You have to use something else along the way. Okay, so uh, we have, we started with an assumption, not Q. We made an inference from it, not P. Right. So what do we do now? Well, that's our conditional, right? That's going to be our conditional. We start with the assumption, not Q. So we put our conditional in there, not Q. Then we have the greater than symbol, not P. Right? And we did this right, using our assumption at line two. So this is the way the citation for conditional proof works. The first number is the number where you made the assumption. The second number is the number where you drew your inference. Right, the line where you drew your inference, okay. and the rule cited will be C P. Now, I, I just a little word of warning: uh, it's not going to be always going to be the case that the uh, that what you infer is going to happen immediately after. There might be some steps in between, uh, and you might use a variety of different rules. But we're, you know, so far <laughs> we're kind of limited. We only have a couple at this point. Okay. <clears throat> now, you might worry that uh, you know we could just start concluding, you know, not Q since we made that assumption. Well, you can't, right? You can't just do, if you're going to infer anything from that assumption, it's got to be included, you know, or it's got to be included in, you know, in that whole line of reasoning, right? And the last bit of that line of reasoning has always, always, always got to be the consequent and your inference, your conclusion, then it's got to be the, uh, uh, that conditional where the assumption is the antecedent and that last bit of inference is the consequent. Okay, so we've got four rules of you've got four rules of implication: modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, conditional proof. Now, uh, you're going to want to use these correctly in order to make valid inferences. Right? You have to make valid inferences, um, and we'll go over, we'll go over some problems in class.